Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerby. And today, I'm super excited to have with me Ryan Caldbeck on the show. Ryan, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I am very excited about our discussion today, which is going to involve a lot of talk around not only your background and, and how you funded Circle Up, but crowdfunding in general and where this is all going. That's such an interesting space. And you have such a great background. So I wanted to kind of start there and learn a little bit about how you got your start, what led you to founding Circle Up and, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Um, so I am from Vermont originally. Um, grew up there, went to college down at Duke. Um, out of college, went into consulting at BCG. Um, and then uh, business school at Sanford. And um, in business school, you know, you kind of, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to explore what you want to do. And I did not do that in business school. Um, I went into business school with a mission, which was to get into growth equity. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, incentives to do that, whether it's financial or, you know, um, you've got a lot of uh, encouragement from the career center and whatnot. <clears throat> um, and so I went into growth equity uh, in 2005. And there were parts of it that I really liked, frankly. Um, did that for, for six years or so, six, almost seven years. Um, really liked who I worked with, uh, loved the team. The pay was phenomenal. Frankly, the hours were incredible. Um, you know, I, I uh, uh, not saying that I was the greatest investor in, in the world, but I, I was pretty darn good. And I did not have to work nearly the hours I did when I was CEO. Um, but I just didn't feel like I was building what I wanted to build. I didn't think I was doing what I wanted to do. Um, you know, after the best days as a growth equity investor, whether that was like a, a you know, huge bonus at the end of the year or a close deal or whatever, I never felt pride, never felt uh, like I wanted to talk to my family or friends about what I was doing. It always changed the subject. And uh, after a lot of soul searching with my then girlfriend, now wife, you know, kind of figured out like, I, I, wanna, I wanna try and build something, build something that'll help others. Um, and that's what led me to, to start Circle Up. Well, real quick about growth equity, there's a, there's a distinction here because that you've got your venture capital, your growth equity, your private equity. You, you specifically chose growth instead of you know, venture or even private equity at first. What led you to that? Is it just a certain market cap, you know, check sizes you're writing? Is there a certain appeal for industry? What, what, what was the appeal of that space in particular? I, I think it'd be disingenuous for me to say, like I had some grand understanding of that world, frankly. Um, had I, I probably would have gone for venture. Um, you know, I think first of all, the terms have, have, uh, have changed over time um, and, and that landscape's evolved quite a bit. But um, when I was doing it, um, you know, private equity, a lot of leverage, uh, much, much larger deals, venture, um, was almost at the time exclusively technology, um, certainly no leverage, typically companies that, that lost money, um, much more speculative than the, than the growth equity deals. Um, and again, those definitions have changed over time. Uh, for me, it was, uh, those were the best firms that I got offers at. That's it. There was not any other grand uh, uh, vision beyond that. So I, I wish that I had taken the time to do that. It's funny, you know, we're kind of coming at this in opposite ways. I, I was an operator and have been and still am with aspirations to do more and more just investing down the road. You started as an investor and then became an operator. I, I'm kind of curious if there's a, 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 an interesting point here about fulfillment, because I've heard, you know, writing checks and those, uh, that side of the table, if you will, can be not that fulfilling because you're not the operator and you're not getting that experience. Is that what you were craving at the time? Or was it, was it uh, not just, it, was it about the actual product itself you wanted to see in the market or, or a certain uh, problem you were trying to solve for? What, what yeah. led you to the circle of, you know, landing on that idea in particular? You know, some of the realizations that I'll talk about now were clarified over time after leaving growth equity and becoming a, um, a founder and CEO. Some of them I knew at the time. And some of them I knew, frankly, even before. So 
I guess it, it probably starts um, when I was kind of late high school, early college. Um, I'm from, as I mentioned, Vermont um, originally, and um, JetBlue, the airline, moved into Burlington. And um, I remember reading an article in the newspaper talking about that. And, and the state, and certainly the area that I lived in, was incredibly excited that JetBlue was going to offer one-way uh, flights to New York City for 50 bucks or so, 25, 50 bucks. And it kind of like opened up this whole new world to the people that lived there of, wow, you can just go there. It doesn't take seven hours to drive through the snow. You can just fly there, have a night and fly back. Um, and I remember thinking like, what an amazing feeling it must be to create something like this, JetBlue, that creates so much joy for other people. And um, you know, for many years, I thought like, I don't care if it's a cardboard box company or a zipper company or whatever, like I just want to build something that helps others. And then you go to college and then you talk with the career center and then you get into a great place like BCG. And then the people at BCG you know, encourage you to go to business school and business school encourages you to go to a hedge fund or private equity. And you let yourself get put on a kind of hamster wheel. Um, and, and that was my fault. Um, I remember in college, I, I talked with um, my uh, the, the head basketball coach um, at Duke, I was a, a walk-on at Duke. So Coach K, who's retiring this year, um, about uh, offers that I had coming out of college. Um, I had an offer at McKinsey, Bain, and BCG. And I went to meet with him and, and he said, well, what are, you, what are you passionate about? And I just, I just at the mo in the moment, I remember where I was sitting when he said this. And I was like, ugh, I kind of, I didn't roll my eyes in front of him, but like in my head, I rolled my eyes. Like thinking like, Coach, you're lucky that you get to work on what you're passionate about. Um, like I don't have, I have to put food on the table. I need to get a job and, uh, I, I think it should be a good job. So like, we got to pick here are the options. And it probably, it took me more than a decade to understand what I think he was saying, which is like, you know, you're talented enough. And I think this is true for, for the vast majority of people, like find something that gives you passion that you want to think about on a Saturday night or on a, you know, in the shower in the morning. Um, that you just, you know, obsess over. And that was not private equity for me. It was not consulting for me. Um, I'm not sure that Coach K is like uber passionate about basketball. I think he's passionate about building teams and creating something that's bigger than himself and bigger than the, you know, um, the, the, the players only. Um, and I missed that concept of, of finding like the root passion um, for me. And so had I taken the time to take a you know a few steps, like I would have understood, like at the time I was passionate about basketball, but had I really thought about it, like I wasn't really passionate about basketball. It was like, how cool is it when you can come together with other people to try and accomplish a goal, to climb a mountain together? I loved when I had leadership roles on different teams. I loved talking to teams. I loved being a leader. Those were things that like are not skills that are really utilized in growth equity, to be frank. Um, you don't really have much of a team and you're not really looked upon to, to stand in front and rally the troops to climb a mountain in the same way. Um, and so I, uh, it took me a long time and uh, frankly took me being successful as a growth equity investor to realize that I didn't like it. Had I failed, I think I would have continuously tried to like push like, okay, I just got to get better at this. Then I'll like it. Then I'll like it. And a problem was like, you know, my last couple of years, it, it went very well and I still was unhappy. And, and, you know, I had some phenomenal years that like I left each kind of comp conversation or closed deal thinking like, meh, I don't really care. Um, and it's true. I loved the CEOs that I worked with, loved my team. But in terms of like the accomplishments, I didn't feel much satisfaction, much intrinsic satisfaction from that. Well, that Coach K piece is incredibly interesting. It didn't come up in my research, but I'm, now I'm filled with questions around that and what you, what you learned from him. Not only, you know, finding what you're passionate about, but oftentimes when you go off and you, you found your own company, you become the leader, you know, not everyone is equipped or even aware that they need to graduate into being a leader of a company. You know, oftentimes when you're founding something, it's just you. And that's all you're worried about is getting this product out. But as you grow and scale a team, that becomes more and more important. So I'm wondering, were you a natural born leader or, or were there tips and tricks you learned under Coach K that even applied to your business 
later on? Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I think it'd be, um, probably ar arrogant or whatnot to say I was natural born leader. I, I can say that I was always um, interested in it and, uh, drawn to it, whether or not I was good at it you know, or I'm good at it today is a different question, but like, you know, I remember, um, in grade school teachers asking me to lead different things that, um, seemed very unique and out of the ordinary. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, I think complimentary and, and were awesome opportunities, um, you know, or captains of different teams or, you know, being just asked to step up in different ways. Um, I loved it. I still do. I, I love that opportunity. Um, and I also learned a lot from coach gay, um, you know, to be frank, like I don't usually like the analogies of sports and business. I, I don't think that they, uh, sometimes they work like the concept of like a, an organization being more like a, a professional sports team than a family, I think makes a lot of sense, but you know, a lot of the tactics that coaches use in sports teams cannot be used in a business setting. You can't scream at your team. You know, you can't swear repeatedly at your team. Um, you know, you can have an engineer who can quit and can get a job at Google the next day. That's a different sort of um, interaction and relationship than exists, at least when I was playing college basketball, where if you transfer, you have to sit out a year. Um, so there's some things that don't transfer over to business. And there's a lot that that does, um, particularly around helping to understand motivations. Um, to help people and help recruit people and help people buy in on a common mission to be a part of something bigger than themselves. You know, I was at a, um, a dinner with some uh, C-level executives from JP Morgan right before COVID. And um, uh, we talked a lot about um, with some other FinTech executives, like the concept of um, uh, what leads great talent to go to, um, you know, a, a startup. And, and one of the things I talked about was like intrinsic motivation, like, you sorry, uh, uh, intrinsic benefits, meaning, you know, the opportunity to grow, the opportunity to help build something, the opportunity to have a seat at the table, the opportunity to like, I feel like you're in the game, you know, coach K was amazing at doing that. Um, I was a manager my first year, which means I swept the floor, made Gatorade, and I was a walk on my last three years. And, um, you feel like what you're doing. This is going to sound like a joke, and I really don't mean it to be. He makes you feel when you're the one holding the marker to hand to him in a huddle. I will tell you, you feel like the most important person in the world. And if you screw up taking off that cap of the marker, and this is not a joke, like you think about it for days um, or sweeping the floor or the Gatorade you're making, he just has an uncanny ability to make you feel like your job is important. And I think that that. Um, that, the, that lesson is something that I tried to do a lot with the team um, when I was CEO. Um, you know, another one is just the importance of, of clear communication of getting everyone on the same page. He did that uh, in an extraordinarily effective way, making sure that everyone was rowing in the same direction, um, communicating with urgency and directness and looking each other in the eye and having hard conversations and being willing to hold each other accountable. Um, those were all things that, uh, and many, many more things that he taught me that um, I've tried to build on as a leader. Now, uh, you know, I'm not trying to compare myself to Coach Gay at all, um, but I certainly, uh, he gave me nor a North Star to, to strive for. Well, sure. I mean, not, not everyone gets that kind of mentorship, I mean, especially from someone like him, even, even directly or indirectly, as you kind of mentioned. Do you ever go to his uh, adult summer camp? It's so funny you say that because uh, I'm on a text thread with our 2001 team um, and uh, I've talked about it with teammates um, a lot. I never have. I've always felt a little bit self-conscious about that. I just, you know, other teammates who I love and we love spending time together outside of that uh, environment, um, you know, those are guys that played in the NBA. And so when they show up to coach people that are Paying, paying tens of thousands of dollars to be at that camp. I think the people paying that money appreciate being coached by them. I've always self-conscious about you know, how excited they'd be to be uh, coached by me uh, in that situation. So uh, I have not, and I, I, I don't know, kind of regret that. 
All right. So going back to, to Circle Up, which is the company you founded after coming out of the, the growth equity space, was there an opportunity there that you, I guess better asked is, what was the opportunity that you saw that you said, I'm going to leave this private equity or this growth equity industry and, and go in on this and solve this problem? Well, the first and most important opportunity is I wanted to build something that had an impact on other people. Um, and so if it wasn't going to be Circle Up, it was going to be something else. I, I wanted to, um, I, you know, going through an exercise with my, again, then, uh, then girlfriend, now wife, Kim, uh, she kind of helped me over the series of several weeks on, on Saturdays, um, draw out what did I care about? What did I love? What did I feel passionate about? What did I not like? Right. And, and we created these huge poster boards, um, that we'd write on each Saturday for a couple hours. And some of them would be silly things. I like Buffalo wings. Some of them would be uh, very important things. I loved to help someone else grow. I loved it. In basketball, I always, you know, this sounds probably like a, I don't know, maybe it's altruistic or whatever. I don't mean it to be, it's very selfish. Like I like to pass to a basket more so than I like to score myself. Like I get goosebumps when there's like a backdoor cut or whatever. And I feel the same way um, about being a CEO. Like when I can help someone else be successful on my team or outside the team, like a, a customer or a teammate, like I just love that. Um, and so it was that exercise that helped me realize like, okay, I don't think this is investing for me. I think it's, you know, building an operating company. Uh, and then in terms of like the, the business um, opportunity, Quick uh, background about um, Circle Up. Circle Up um, started as a marketplace that helped connect investors with consumer companies. Consumer meaning food, beverage, personal care, pet products, things like that. Um, that's an industry that's about um, uh, three times the size of tech, um, has um, uh, terrific returns um, on par with tech, but with about half the volatility of tech. Uh, and yet there's about 150th, 175th the amount of early stage funding for those companies, at least there was at the time. And I started Circle Up with uh, the, the thesis that like it's, you know, all the returns are great. The problem in this industry is that the cost to find the companies is just way too high. So there's no Silicon Valley for these consumer companies, right? The, the companies are just as likely to be in Portland, Oregon, Austin, Texas, as they are LA or, or New York. But on top of that, there's no infrastructure like Y Combinator or TechCrunch to help investors and companies connect more efficiently. And so Rory and I had the thesis that you could use a marketplace model to help uh, these companies connect um, and over time add value to them in a variety of different ways. Um, so the, that was the original idea behind Circle Up. Great idea in concept, right? Like fantastic idea. Like I heard about it for the first time and said, oh my gosh, hallelujah, someone is democratizing this and getting people involved in these companies who need funding and making that connection. So what went wrong? <laughs> what, you know, how did that not prove out? And because, you know, ultimately Circle Up pivoted to other things. So maybe yeah. talk to us a little bit about why that was. Yeah. So we pivoted after um, about five and a half years or so, about five years, um, to another model, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you know, I think it depends. In some ways, Circle Up did really, really well with that model. Um, you know, we attracted some phenomenal investors. Union Square Ventures was our lead investor along with Google Ventures, Canaan Partners, um, Rose Park, which is Clayton Christensen's fund, um, you know, did really, really well. Um, the vanity metrics, things like GMV, were fantastic. The problem, and um, I went to the, the board about this in advance of recommending that we were going to pivot, or that we pivot, was that um, it didn't seem like we were building a good business. The vanity metrics were great. We were going to keep raising money as a technology startup um, because sometimes there are investors who, you know, even in later rounds like those vanity metrics. But the, I just thought we were selling dollars for 40 cents, 50 cents. So why? Um, I think the biggest reason, and I, I um, you know, have put out some content about this on Twitter. Um, I think the biggest reason that that model didn't work is that the financial feedback loop uh took years, meaning if you were an investor and you came on a circle up and you invested, um, it would be five, six, seven years before you got your money back. 
And so, you know, we had investors that put uh, money into Beyond Meat early. And uh, there's one investor that put 250,000 in and took out about $31 million. And that's a phenomenal return. And it took five years, you know? And so along the way, uh, you know, you can give them updates on how the business is doing, but fundamentally, if you're not able to take your cash out, there's a lot of investors who are going to be hesitant, hesitant to put more money in. Um, I think that feedback loop was brutal um, and made it really difficult to uh, encourage at least the investor side of the market. Um, follow up for follow on investment. For follow on investment, yeah. And if you're just acquiring new customers, which would be the investor side of the marketplace, each time, you know, there's not much of a network effect there, right? Um, and you're kind of selling deals then kind of to a new investor base each time. And that's that's a hard way to build a business. Um, you know, Uber and Airbnb and others work because both sides of the marketplace um, tend to be repeat customers. There's a frequency of transaction. You know if you like your Airbnb immediately, if you like your Uber ride immediately, and you can give feedback on that and both sides can respond, right? Or respond to that feedback. Um, so I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, probably the number one reason. There are a number of other reasons as well, but like the number one reason why I think that that model did not work um, is that one. So that explains it from a business point of view, but from the actual investors using the platform and the businesses, was there a fundamental flaw there as well, or was it just strictly on the business side? You know, um, look, I'm biased, right? So let's, let's, uh, Let's caveat everything I'm going to say with that I am biased. I think the um, market equity marketplace, or you know, in some cases, crowdfunding. I, I always kind of bristle at that term, but other people um, use it. Um, model uh, I think works in some industries, and it really does not work in others. So, in the technology world, um, there's a lot of sources for capital for technology companies, a lot, um, and uh, in the consumer space at least for companies with less than 10 million in revenue, when we started Circle Up, there were not. And so I think that there is an adverse selection that exists in these types of marketplaces that work with technology companies that I didn't think existed for our consumer companies, but of course, I'm biased. You know, at the time when we started Circle Up for several years, if you Googled early stage consumer product funds, you wouldn't find five in the United States. If you did the same thing for technology, you'd find 750 um, as an example. So. I think adverse selection is meaningful um, for some industries on the entrepreneur side. Um, I think the cost to uh, uh, working with a wide variety of investors is pretty meaningful, um, uh, particularly those that are less sophisticated. And you see that on some of the platforms today, you've got a lot of dentists and doctors who you know invest and don't understand really what they're investing to. That leads to real issues. Um, uh, and on the investor side, uh, you know, beyond the adverse selection, I think you know these concept the concept of like getting transparency into the deal, the valuation, of how the deal performing on an ongoing basis, et cetera. I don't like what I see out there. I mean, what I see is is a lot of kind of pseudo celebrity angel investors that raise you know syndicates or whatnot, and um, it scares me. Um, it, it it really scares me. Uh, and That's some of them I've talked to privately and, and they talk about like, they put their worst deals in those quote unquote syndicates. Um, and I don't know why that's a good thing. <clears throat> that point in particular resonates with me because when I've been on these platforms, the valuations I've seen have been astronomical, right? right. In some cases, and even in, you know, businesses and industries that I'm very knowledgeable on, <laughs> I would yeah. say, you know, I look at these valuations and it, it seems just sort of like an abuse or something of that lack of transparency in some ways. Is that, does that need more regulation? Is there a loophole people are getting away with here? Is it just, what, what is causing this kind of lack of transparency or lack of standard standardization, I think, when it comes to things like valuation? You know, that, that could probably be a four hour podcast on its own, to be frank. Um, I think that the, a lot of the regulation in private investing has hurt investors, frankly. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
accredited investors, um, you know, people with more more than a million dollars in, in net worth, excluding their home, make two hundred thousand dollars a year as an individual, three hundred thousand dollars a year as a couple. Um, those are investors that have access to uh, be able to invest in private deals, whether those VC funds, uh, hedge funds, or individual deals, and there allows them to be wealthier, right? The rich get richer, um, and unaccredited investors don't. I don't think that that's fair, and. I think the lack of information standardization is a really bad thing. Um, you know, we were, we were, I think the only, or maybe one of two uh, platforms that got registered by FINRA. Um, and so we, um, we were a registered broker dealer because uh, we were trying to do it the right way. And the problem with that is that then the things we could communicate about these companies um, was, was much more restrictive. Um, and so information that I would have wanted as an investor, I couldn't tell our investors because FINRA prevented that. Um, it's a shame, um, but I think that that's part of the um, inefficiency in that in that industry right now. So do I think that there's more transparency and, and standardization needed? Probably. Um, it's also hard for me to completely sign up for more regulation. I think the regulation needs to be different, fin frankly. I think FINRA uh, needs a dramatic overhaul. And what's funny is people from FINRA would tell you that. People from FINRA would, would come in, you know, do their annual audit of us as they do for all broker dealers and privately tell us this needs to change, meaning FINRA needs to change. Um, but like some other organizations, it's just really, really slow moving. See, what I like about this conversation is I can tell you have a passion for these unaccredited investors and having been one myself, it's I have the same passion and, and you you come out with the best incentives to say this is a platform to help equalize the playing field and crowds crowdfunding has become more and more prominent over the last few years there's a number of companies doing it as you alluded to or mentioned earlier as new investors who are listening to our show right now are considering investing using one of these platforms what would be like your best advice for trying to get your arms around the information as much as possible on a deal to make sure you're protecting yourself um, from some of the things we just talked about? Um, well, I'm really hesitant to give any investment advice. Um, so, you know, you should be talking to people that um, uh, understand your financial, that, you know, whoever the listener is, your financial situation um, and understand uh, the investing world. I think some pretty safe pieces of feedback are one, um, you have to diversify a lot. So, you know, if you want to allocate, let's say 3% of your investable net worth into private deals, that 3% should then be split up into 10 or 15 different companies. It should not be into two companies. Um, that's just gambling. I don't care how good of an investor you are. Um, and so the mistake people make is like, you know what, I want to do it, put $100,000 into a private company and I'll just kind of see for a couple of years. Well, that's a way to lose a lot of money. Take $100,000 and invest it into 10 companies, 12 companies, right? and do that over the course of two years. Don't do it in a month. Um, so I think diversification is, is absolutely critical. Um, then I would develop a framework on your own. There's a lot of blogs about private investing. Um, Bill Gurley, Andreessen Horowitz, Fred Wilson at ABC, uh, USV, which is blogs, uh, abc.com, um, uh, Sarah Tavel at, at Benchmark and a number of others um, do a lot of reading about different frameworks and how to evaluate the types of companies you're interested in. If you're looking at a marketplace, Jeff Jordan at Andreessen, um, uh, uh, Sarah at Benchmark, et cetera, Bill Gurley. Um, to create frameworks on how to break down these businesses to understand them. Um, and then make sure you get the right information to evaluate the company. A lot of these platforms, it's super high level information, inability to talk with the founder. And to me, that's a recipe to lose a lot of money. It is, uh, especially through uh, you know, the, these investing groups where I'm going to invest behind John Smith. John Smith may or may not have access to the data. Um, by the way, he's going to get paid whether or not the deal makes money. Um, that's a scary place to be. Talk, talk to us a little bit more about that. Uh, what you're describing sounds a lot like what you find on something like AngelList, perhaps, where you're following someone well-known and, and they set up a SVP or some kind of fund and you're, you're, you're leaning on them to find you the deals. Is that what you're referring to there as far as uh, 
or is this um, a so I, I look I uh, I really respect um, you know founders who are trying to build something CEOs who are trying to build something particularly private markets and so I, I don't want to talk about any specific platform but in general I think you need to make sure that your incentives are aligned with the people you're investing behind. And so if that is a, a, you know, a fund manager or a syndicate lead or whatever it is, um, you know, do you win when they win? Do they lose when you lose? Right. That's not true for all of these platforms. Um, and I would just dig in hard onto those incentive structures because no matter who this investor is, if they win, when you lose, you know, you can be sure that you're not going to be getting their best deal flow. And that's just because they're getting some type of advisory shares. Just it might be. Yeah, they might be. Position. Yeah. I just think it's something that is something important to dig into. Um, uh, you know, look, I, I think it, it's possible to make good investments on these platforms. Um, I think it uh, just requires a level of sophistication and work that not all investors are willing to put in. Um and especially when it comes to like a, a technology name that seems to be hot. Um, and that's a really quick way to lose a lot of money. <clears throat> Having started your own company, what have been some of the biggest mm -hmm. learnings or biggest surprises, you know, from found, founding it, fundraising it, nurturing it? What are just some of the biggest takeaways now you've had some time to reflect on being the, the CEO of your own company? What kind of, what are your biggest takeaways from that? You know, um, there's a, a number of things that I will do differently when I am CEO again. Um, you know, the first thing you mentioned was, was funding or fundraising. Um, I, in general, was incredibly fortunate with the investors that we raised money from. I mean, some of the best investors in the world, I mentioned uh, some of them also TPG, Tomasic, a number of others. Um, uh, so by and large, I felt really fortunate, really lucky. Um, and um, we had one or two difficult experiences too. And I think what I learned from both of those is that uh, the importance of aligning on mission and vision is not just motherhood and apple pie. Um, you know, companies, particularly startups, pivot. They change direction. They have to change direction. And if you've got an investor that is just dialed into, let's say the financial forecast that you put, or just dialed into the particular product that you're building right now, or whatever it is, um, and doesn't really care or isn't aligned with the mission or vision, then when it comes time to tweak it, to tweak the product, to do something different, that might be consistent with the mission or vision, but is not consistent with, let's say, the product that that person invested into, it creates a lot of pain. So getting alignment upfront on, um, does this person care about the mission and vision? Why do they care? You know, what does this mean for them? If we have to pivot the company, but we say consistent with the mission and vision, what does that mean? Um, I think that that is absolutely critical. I think alignment in terms of values um, is also really important. Um, and and those, that comes through conversations. You know, a difficult thing, I've talked with a lot of GPs, um, general partners at different VC firms over the last couple of months about Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card, and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards, and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app, and then it produces the uh, reward, but the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have, and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card. And so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self-custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform. And every single swipe, I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is this thing is a no-brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off. Uh, there's spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TA. 
how deals are moving really quickly and on Zoom. And people are talking to the company for the first time on a Friday. I talked to a top four VC last week, two weeks ago, meeting company on a Friday and investing on a Monday. You know, um, that um, sounds like a good thing for a lot of founders. And uh, I would have concern that you don't really know what you're getting to bed with. Like you don't understand if there's a vision alignment, mission alignment, values alignment. And these are multi-year relationships. I'm not going to tell you it's as important as a marriage, but like you spend a lot of time with these people and go through a lot of battles together. Um, and I think some of the good fortune that I had with investors was because we did a, a pretty good job of, of diligencing them most of, most of them. We made one pretty big, big mistake, but most of the time we did a pretty good job. And some of it was just luck, just flat out luck. Um, so I think, you know, from a fundraising standpoint, getting that alignment up front before you take money is important. Um, yeah. On, on that point, what's coming to my mind is a, this comment. Uh, I think it's in the Brad Feld book, Venture Deals. He says, you know, you should walk away when the potential investor during their due diligence starts to feel like a proctologist. <laughs> Meaning they're digging in too much, right? So is there a balance here? Because, you know, I can totally understand that the snap judgments being made over Zoom but on the flip side of that, there are other diligence processes that are much more involved. How do you strike that happy medium between the two? Brad's a great investor. Um, and I think he's also not just a, a great investor from a return standpoint, but in, uh, founders love working with him. I would probably tweak what he said. I, I think I, I mean, the point we're trying to make, um, the point trying to make, I think is a good one. But I think for me, I would probably tweak it a bit to say like, um, uh, proctologists are, are serve a good role in the world. And I'm not trying to be funny. Like they serve a good role, right? When the investors are asking questions that are just not productive, that's when you should walk away. Um, you know, I've had a colonoscopy, right? Like it sinks, but like there is a purpose to it. And diligence, I really liked when it was tough, and um, ask really hard, but great questions. Then when there's diligence where the investor is asking just irrelevant questions, just things that have nothing to do with the strength of our business, that but, you know, really detailed droning on about just stuff that doesn't matter. That's when uh, you should be scared as a founder. It's so easy for me to sit here in Silicon Valley um, and, and the you know, the fortune and privilege that I have and talk about walking away from an investor. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who cannot do that. It's not easy to raise money for a lot of founders. I would just offer up that sometimes it is worse to raise that money than it is to not. There are some investors who are going to be willing to give you money and will make your life a living hell. Um, and not taking their money, even if it means the company didn't work out or you have to take it on worse terms or something else, could end up being a better thing. So the proctologist analogy, I know what he's trying to do. Um, I think I just kind of tweak it a little bit to say like, you know, when they're asking really detailed, unimportant questions and focusing on the wrong issues, that's only going to get worse. Um, and it's going to suck up a lot of your time and be frustrating. And that frustration is going to shine through and you're going to spiral into a bad relationship with that uh, investor. I love that nuance. I think that's fantastic. I, I heard some interesting advice the other day, which was basically something along the lines of you can have great terms and you can have a great price, but you can't have both. And if you were given the choice, you would take the terms over the price. I'm wondering if you just hearing that, what your general knee jerk reaction takeaway would be if you agree with that statement or sentiment at all. Oh, like if you were forced, I mean, obviously you don't have to only pick one, but you're saying, you're saying if you had to pick one, yeah, I'd pick great terms over price. Yes, for sure. Um, price, you know, uh, I'm so glad that I'm not an active investor when I'm saying this, um, I do some, I just mentioned investing, but I mean, on behalf of an institution, like I just genuinely think price is vastly overrated. Um, you know, if your company is successful, you're going to make a lot of money. And, and so like, it might be the difference between, you know, three 
uh, three homes and four, but like uh, you're gonna make a lot of money if your company is successful. Terms will make life very difficult. Bad terms will make, you know, a, a poor valuation rarely does. You might end up with too little of the company, but usually good boards will give you more. They'll give you follow grants and I've written about that publicly um, in terms of CEO compensation, but terms are really hard to reverse and tend to compound um, in terms of the problems that they create over time. As future investors come in, they either take the exact same terms or they sometimes make them worse. Um, and that gets, that gets difficult. Now, is there some nuance there? I'm curious because I was thinking about Warren Buffett just now. Our friend Brent B. Shore had dinner with him once and was really pressing him on, you know, this handshaky kind of way he does deals and somewhat seemingly lack of due diligence. And I guess Warren said, price is my due diligence. I mean, you know, he really low balls or gets something super cheap and that's his protection long-term. So I'm wondering, that makes a little bit more sense to me innately just maybe in public markets or something where it's a little bit not so new or nascent, like a venture deal. Um, but I, I'm curious if that resonates with you. Well, um, a couple of thoughts. One, uh, Warren Buffett's a better investor in it than I am. So if you get a chance, listen to Warren, not me. Two, um, I'm talking about it on behalf of founders. I'm not talking about it on behalf of investors. Um, three, he is a public guy, right? He's not a private guy. Um, now, there have been some uh, interesting examples that I'm thinking of where he did care a lot about terms. You know, in the 08 financial crisis, when he invested into Goldman, um, he did not get uh, just a good price. He got great terms too. Um, you know, I, I forget what those were. I knew it at one point, but like it was a, uh, it, the terms are what made the deal uh, attractive, you know, in a lot of different scenarios. So, um, you know, in the public markets, yeah, I understand like price matters um, or, or even like late stage, late, late, late stage uh, privates, um, price is probably more important, but for entrepreneurs and startups, um, I, think, uh, I think the terms are more important. Curious really quickly about the way you compose your board at Circle Up. Were they all investors in the space? Did you recruit anyone who wasn't an investor to join the board? And, and if so, what was the profile you were looking for, for, for that kind of guidance? We've had, um, there, there are a number of things that I will do differently next time I'm CEO. Um, and uh, one of them is I will look more actively uh, for independent board members. Um, so we have had two um, uh, over the past 10 years at Circle Up. Um, one is the current CEO of Lending Club, um, Scott Sanborn, uh, uh, and um, the other is uh, a phenomenal investor at, um, uh, at Bridgewater. Um, and uh, both, uh, I wish that we had always had one, uh, but it takes time to get that. It's a bit like um, a bit like finding a therapist, frankly. You know, I, I, there have been years where I knew I needed a therapist, but it's a 30-hour investment to find it. And it's just really hard to justify that. Um, and so I'm doing it now. Um, right when I'm not CEO today, so that it pays dividends, um, you know, throughout whether I'm a CEO or not. And an independent board member takes a long time to get. Um, so we had, we have had it, and I wish we did it more. The other board members that we had were the um, investors that led the various rounds. Um, so Union Square was on our board, Keenan was on our board, or is on our board. Um, they both are. Um, Rose Park Advisors is on our board. Um, and then we stopped giving board seats after the Series C or so. Um, uh, and that board has has been fantastic for us. You mentioned when you're CEO again. I'd like to kind of talk about what it looks like for Ryan Caldbeck to be CEO again, what that venture would look like, and how you would be different. So... I am, you know, at the beginning of this year, I was kind of 50-50 if I wanted to be an investor next or a, uh, uh, an operator. Now I am positive I'll be an operator next. Eventually I'll probably be an investor again, but I want to be an operator again. I love leading. I love building. I love creating a team, creating a culture. Um, I love the things that go into that. I... Um, and thinking a lot about, does that mean I want to join something as like a CEO, COO, or do I want to start something? Um, but, you know, I've done a lot of reflection on my time as CEO, like 
what do I think I did well? What do I think I didn't do well? What would I change next time? Um, and so, you know, in terms of like organizationally, um, there's a number of things that I would do differently um, or that I think we did really well, right? So I think we did a good job defining upfront what to look for in teammates um, and to create a process to kind of institutionalize that. I'm really proud of that. And I will lean into that heavily next time. Um, we'll actively recruit teammates with a growth mindset. I think that's critical in a startup. Uh, we'll actively try to build a culture that's intellectually honest, you know, that doesn't search to uh, be right. It searches to find the right answer. Um, I uh, will value startup experience over big company experience, lean a lot into professional development for the team. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of things like that. It's mostly cultural that either I think we did well or I've learned from and, and want to uh, do a better job of. Um, and I've written about that um, on my, uh, on my uh, website, uh, ryancallbuck.co. Um, in terms of like industry, you know, there's a lot of different things that interest me. I've, been, I've gotten a lot of calls on, on existing companies or starting something new in a variety of different industries from you know, FinTech, a circle of us, a FinTech company, um, to other uh, you know, kind of subdomains within technology. Um, and you know, I find myself gravitating a lot towards Web3 stuff. Um, uh, I think it'll be the biggest technological jump in the last 20 years. I think it'll be more important than mobile, frankly. Um, so I find myself getting really, really excited about that as an operator and, and what that unlocks. Um, but I still feel like, I think a lot of people that are going down that rabbit hole, um, I still feel like I am on the, you know, one yard line trying to understand, and I've got 90 10 yards left to go trying to understand the space and all the implications behind it. You know, on that front, I'm curious to get your opinion on this. Um, there's a sentiment out there about the Web3 space that is essentially, I would put it like a way for venture capitalists to take their company private almost, or sorry, take their company public sooner, you know, and without all the same kind of regulation, whether it's an existing company or new company, there's this idea that people are going to be, you know, it's kind of the wild west, I guess. So going back to that sentiment about protecting investors, how do you think, uh, or how should investors be exploring this space and, and making sure that they're not uh, subject to any sort of misalignment as we kind of alluded to earlier? There is a lot of hype um, behind Web3. And, um, you know, I think we, we had a period uh, two years ago, three years ago or so, um, around the, the ICOs, initial coin offerings, um, where there was just, it was kind of rampant fraud, frankly, um, and, and uh, failure, failure and fraud <clears throat> um, of, those, uh, of a lot of them. Um, on top of that, there is tremendous volatility in terms of the, the tokens and, and currencies um, in, in the crypto space. Um, and so it is a space where uh, you can see someone making millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, and you can see people losing everything. And the latter is much more private than the former, right? Um, so, you know, what would I say to people listening? I'd say, first of all, Ryan is 300 hours in, not 3,000 or 30,000 hours in to understanding Web3. Um, there are some people who understand that market incredibly well. Um, and I would urge you to spend the next year digging in before you um, put a material amount of money of your own into the space. Um, two, I think diversification is really important. Fred Wilson just put out a post about um, diversifying um, uh, in that space. Um, that I think is a really important one. Um, you know, but... It, I hate investing in the things that I don't understand. And the more um, I have dug in, the more I think I understand about it, even though there's a lot I don't, and uh, the more I love it um, and think it is incredibly um, impactful. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. Well, let's talk about the, the benefits that you're seeing, because I'm curious, you said it's a big comment to say, biggest thing in 20 years in, in tech in the future, uh, what does that future look like? What are the investors, what are the benefits, I guess, is the best way to frame it? 
someone tweeted, and I, I wish I could remember who, because I want to give this person credit, um, you know, Web1, um, which is kind of a, up to the early 2000s, was the right period. You would read um, things on the internet, on a website. Web2, which is, you know, Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, um, uh, et cetera, um, was read write, meaning you could also create content yourself. This is, this is sounding like a Greg Eisenberg tweet. Does that maybe, sound? Maybe, maybe. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, gonna... And then, yeah. And then uh, web three is read write own. So it gives people the opportunity to participate in the uh, value that they are creating. You know, um, more than a few people have commented that if you are using a product and you're not paying for it, you are the product, right? And your data is being sold, et cetera. And there's been a lot of um, bad things that have come out of that. And some good things, but some bad things that come out of that. Um, as the um, uh, social dilemma of the movie um, would talk about. When you think of an example, our company like Uber or Airbnb, um, for the market participants to own a piece of the market through tokens, as an example, um, if those companies were uh, set up as DAOs. That um, incentivizes them to help the market grow in ways that they are not only not incentivized, but in some ways, perhaps even disincentivized to do in the current structure. Um, I think that's a game changer. I think it accentuates network effects. Um, so I think it, it's one of you know several different advantages or many different advantages uh, to this concept of, of a DAO in that case. Um, but Web3 overall, like the ability to not just read Web1 or read, write Web2, but read, write, own in Web3, um, I think unlocks just some magical properties about building organizations um, with new business models that can um, help transform the world. I, I'd love to get your take on, speaking of DAOs, there was a recent one called Constitution Dow, yep. where they were literally trying to fundraise and buy a copy of the Constitution from Sotheby's or some auction. When I was looking into that, I noticed that you know, when, by buying a stake in the Dow, you weren't actually getting any equity of the actual constitutional document itself. You were getting these government rights or governance mm -hmm. rights. So you know, you could vote on where the document is stored or. There's a few other examples they listed and and admittedly very well and trans i would say very transparently written on the website of the company there you know so they were being very forthright with what you're getting when you put money into the space but i think that there were a lot of folks on twitter or wherever getting involved thinking they're going to buy this and own a piece of this document and when that document sells again they're going to get some money from that but that didn't seem to be the case that as far as I understood it. So if you know more about this subject than me, I'm, I'm curious to know, because this is the only example I know yet of a, of a DAO and how it works. And that seemed like a little bit of a misalignment or some, something that wasn't maybe what it appeared on the surface, but what's your take on it? Yeah, um, that was happening during a week um, or a period when I was, um, when my family and I were visiting my parents. So I'll be frank with you and say I was a lot less uh, in tune with that than I would have liked to admit. But in general, um, I think you identified one of the uh, incredible benefits of DAOs and one of the early complications. So an incredible benefit of them is that um, they are extremely transparent, both in terms of how they are designed right? Um, the code is out there for anyone to see. <clears throat> um, and in terms of uh, uh, culture, um, I'm a part of a, a couple of different um, Discord servers and, and um, some other groups that uh, are actually talking about Web3 and in particular DAOs. And a, a common um, uh, kind of piece of feedback about uh, a, a DAOs that we're evaluating um, is around the importance of transparency to understand who is the team, where do they come from, what 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 are the rules of this DAO, and so while a lot of that is just structurally in there, you all, there's also like a demand culturally for them to be transparent, um, which I think is great, um, and I think the Constitution DAO was transparent, and there are also people who will make snap decisions without trying to understand that, right? So when you can put twenty five dollars in to the, or hundred dollars into the Constitution DAO. And uh, it requires a fair amount of work to understand whether or not you are actually getting a piece of the DAO, or uh, excuse me, of the constitution. Um, there will be a lot, and there were some people that just said, eh, I'm not gonna do the work. I'm not gonna you know, try and understand this. Um, 
my hope is that that evolves over time, um, that people become more sophisticated and that tools are created to help people understand the what they're actually getting when they are uh, committing to uh, to DAOs. So look, we're, we're so early. I think someone I heard yesterday on, a, on the podcast talk about like, we're not in the bottom of the first inning um, in terms of this world. Um, so I think that there's a lot to understand, but just fundamentally um, what blockchain technology can do and, and, and what some of the other innovations over the last several years have allowed us to do, not just in terms of moving money, but in terms of creating smart contracts and organizational structures that allow new business models to form, I think is incredibly powerful and gets me really excited. So having been at the top of a company, you know what it's like to run a large organization. And, you know, as uh, even Ray Dalio runs Bridgewater, there's that merit idea meritocracy element involved where not everyone's opinion has equal weight. So I'm curious, that's kind of what a, a DAO sounds like as far as the governance is concerned of a new organization. I guess they're weighted based on stake, but you know, knowing how hard it is to run a, an organization top down, do you see that it, there would be, what would, what would be the benefit, I guess, of having it more distributed as far as the governance is concerned? Well, it doesn't have to be run that way, right? So there are some DAOs that are not run that way. So some DAOs are run based on how many tokens you hold. Some DAOs are, uh, you know, the, the values of the tokens or how many tokens you have are dependent upon, let's say, the contributions you make to the DAO or how long you've held them for, right? And so an investor coming in and out and doesn't add any value, you know, gets fewer tokens or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think it, it depends on how the DAO is set up, but you can reward people for their contributions and you can reward them for their contributions in real time. It's not just, you know, at Circle Up, we would move comp twice a year, right? And um, a very imperfect measure of someone's actual contribution. With the exception of maybe a sales team at all organizations, it's extremely hard to understand through contribution. I mean, try interviewing a product manager or a designer from Apple. Like, good luck on understanding what they've actually built and how much of it was part of them versus the team of 50 that was doing the same project. Um, <clears throat> with, uh, uh, you know, DAO structure, I think that that is a bit easier. Um, but look, all this stuff is going to evolve. Um, and so I am excited about um, uh, a number of things that we've talked about here. And I'm excited about what will come, what has not yet been built. There's a, um, um, you know, Chris Dixon uh, talks, and, and Jason does, and they're not the only ones who do this, but um, talk a lot about kind of, we're in this kind of, uh, period of like skeuomorphic, um, um, uh, you know, analogies um, in in Web three, where people are using existing business models from Web two and trying to apply Web three to that, um, just as people did with. Um, he used an example the other day, Chris did, um, of looking at the uh, first commercials for the iPhone. Steve Jobs and the you know Apple was putting out commercials for the iPhone that revolved around using the iPhone to look up recipes in the kitchen. And like, that couldn't be a less important use of the iPhone today. Um, but people were trying to use what they knew about the world to predict how people would use the technology. I think we're in that phase for Web3 today. So what I look at is that fundamentally this technology allows for new things. How the technology will be used, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Frankly, and I don't. I don't think that there's. Uh, I, I haven't heard many people talk that sound like they know. But I'm extra, incredibly interested in um, how uh, value will be unlocked through Web three. What you're talking about sounds a lot like you know stuff you can't learn in, in business school necessarily. Although I know Stanford and some others are, are pioneering DAO uh, education and a lot of stuff already. But it just reminds me of like maybe, it just reminds me of what you've learned um, having coming out, ha having come out of Stanford Business School that you probably didn't find in school. Meaning, are there any other resources, maybe even investing books that you have found made a big impact on your career so far? It might be beneficial for those listening today. Um, books, you know, I look, I think the intelligent investor, um, 
uh, is, is just, you know, if you're going to be an investor, I think you have to read that book. Even if you're a VC investor, um, I think it's just such a, a fantastic book. Um, I think, you know, a number of books that lay out like Warren Buffett's um, annual letters, I think are really good. Um, I tend to, as an investor, even really like a lot of the books about entrepreneurship to understand, or uh, being a CEO, to understand the mind of a CEO and, and how to build businesses in a uh, in a healthy and enduring way, um, and the and to create empathy for the CEO. Hard thing about hard things uh, by Ben Horowitz, uh, Zero to One, Peter Thiel um, are great books. But like, you know, I think what I've learned over the last ten years is I and I, I read a lot, uh, both books, blogs. Um, and, you know, I, I am a bigger fan of what you can get online right now than, um, most books, um, particularly investing books. Like I think, and maybe people might laugh at this, but I think Twitter is a hell of a resource for understanding, um, investing. That's a dangerous one because there's a lot of people spouting off that have no idea what they're talking about. Um, but you know, blogs from world-class investors, um, you know, annual, um, annual reports, um, from a number of different public market investors, I think are really good books, you know, that take three years to write and tend to be watered down by editors to appeal to the airport, uh, convenience store crowd. I just don't tend, I, I think that's, are usually not as good. Um, so I found a lot more value from some of the blogs that I've mentioned um, and some other sources like that. One question, just circling back to accredited investors, does something like a DAO, is part of the appeal, this idea that we are kind of breaking that tradition of having accredited investors only benefiting from great opportunities? Does this help equalize in any, any way in that regard? I think it should. I think there's a lot to get sorted out. Um, you know, we just talked about uh, people not totally understanding whether or not they're getting a piece of the um, constitution. And again, I'm not familiar with that enough. Um, so uh, there's danger to that, right? And and I don't actually believe that accredited investors are more sophisticated than accredited investors, but they certainly can afford to lose the money more so than most of accredited investors. Um, and so I think we need the market needs to mature, but I think that there is potential for for um, some of these new structures, particularly uh, DAOs, to um, help unaccredited investors participate. In your next venture, do you think it will be uh, fintech related? I don't know. I like fintech. Um, I uh, do some investing in fintech. It'll be technology related. It'll definitely be technology related. I'm a uh, you know technology operator. Um, so, but it doesn't have to be fintech. I think there's a lot of different fields. You know, my wife's the CMO at Coursera, the edu edu um, ed tech company. Um, uh, ed tech interests me, healthcare interests me, particularly mental health. Um, fintech interests me, B2B or B2C. Um, there's a lot of things that I get excited about. I think, I just think we live in such an exciting time. I mean, in the course of human history, when has there ever been as much innovation? in a 10, 20 year span as what we're seeing right now. You know, you look at the gold rush in 1840s or so, look at the Renaissance in Italy, but like the innovation that's happening right now is so incredible. So to be able, you as a founder know this, like to be able to participate and try and build something right now. Yeah, what a gift to be able to talk to our kids and our grandkids about that in 30, 40 years. I don't know how long this period of innovation will last. I hope it lasts for a long time, but like, I just feel so lucky to be building right now versus 50 years ago. Yeah, there seems to be this feeling, this acceleration happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's what we're all trying to process is just how fast things are only compounding and getting faster. Right. We're trying right. to like stay up to speed and right. then it's dated all of a sudden. And, and it does make it very exciting, but also just overwhelming sometimes as, as well, and yeah. at least in my experience. Ryan, yeah. this has been so great. I, I really love this discussion and I really admire what you've built and the way you've approached it. Um, and I'm really excited to, to stay in touch and see what this next venture looks like for you. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Before I, before I let you go, I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to hand off to our audience where they can follow along with what you're doing, where they can learn more about you or any other resources you want to share. Sure. Um, uh, so on Twitter, it's just Ryan underscore Kaltbeck. Um, and my website where I post a lot of blogs um, is ryankaltbeck.co. Fantastic. Well, Ryan, if we do this a year from now, I'm sure the world will look even different and there'll be a lot to talk about. So let's do it again. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Okay. Cheers. Thanks. 
thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 